Well, thank you. I'm going to talk to you about this wonderful molecular machine called the ribosome. Uh, and I think of it as the mothership of life. It w has been with us since the beginning of life as we know it. Um, so why ribosomes? The, um, they're fundamental to life, as you just heard, making all proteins for all living cells. Bacterial ribosomes are the target of many antibiotics, and ribosomes are believed to be a link to the RNA world, where we came from. So, to uh, go to the basics, life is based on two languages. Uh, the language of DNA and RNA are nucleotides, G-A-C-T or G-A-C-U in the case of RNA. Um, and the language of proteins is amino acids, and there are 20 of those. And these are, uh, as these two languages are, 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 are as different as English and Chinese. The, the characters or the alphabets are unrelated, the structures are unrelated, the syntax is unrelated. Um, so ribosomes translate the RNA language into protein language. So on the one hand, we have our genotype, uh, the chromosomes. On the other hand, the phenotype, who we are. And um, the genotype, of course, determined by RNA, the phenotype by our proteins, and the intermediary is RNA. And when we look at this process, this is a very RNA-rich step here. The ribosomes uh, contain ribosomal RNA, then you have messenger RNA, tRNA, and the, um, the, this language is bridged by the genetic code in what we call translation, and it really is translation. So the genetic code is the Rosetta Stone between the very different languages of DNA and RNA and protein. Uh, each amino acid is in the protein is determined by a codon in the uh, uh, messenger RNA, which is transcribed from the gene in the DNA, and so then each codon specifies an, an amino acid in the protein via the genetic code. There are 64 codons, three of which are stop codons. The rest, the other 61, specify different amino acids. The messenger RNA uh, is held in a single-stranded form inside the ribosome and is read in groups of three nucleotides as codons. The interpreter is the tRNA, which at one end reads the codons uh, by base pairing with the anticodon, these three nucleotides at the bottom here. At the opposite end, amino acids or the peptidyl, growing peptidyl chain of the protein are attached, and this is where the chemistry happens. So this shows how the tRNAs base pair with the messenger RNA uh, codons, this is A site and P site tRNAs in the ribosome uh, pairing with their messenger RNA codons, with their anticodon ends. The um, molecular structure of the ribosome was a huge step forward in understanding how translation works. And this happened about 15 years ago in, in several labs, uh, in the Stites lab at Yale, uh, the Ramakrishnan lab in Cambridge, and the Yonath lab in Israel, as well as our lab in Santa Cruz. Um, so the ribosome structure is about one millionth of an inch in diameter, 250 angstroms, uh, and is one of the largest and most complex molecular structure in all of biology. Its, just, its structure was determined by X-ray crystallography, and this required making crystals of ribosomes, which was a tremendous challenge for many years. Um, and the, this is what ribosome crystals look like. Um, and so in order to figure out the structure, you have to put these in an X-ray beam, uh, and it has to be a very powerful X-ray beam because the unit cells of these crystals are very large. And we use an instrument about the size of a football field called a synchrotron. This is, happens to be the uh, storage ring at the advanced 
light source at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory where we collected our, our very first data. Um, and this shows uh, as a picture of Marat Yusupov now in Strasbourg, uh, mounting a crystal in the goniometer um, at, at the uh, beam line. So the beam actually comes through the little, um, not this guy here, but the a little pencil sized uh, collimator just to the right there. Um, and then the, uh, the uh, x-rays shoot through the crystal and end up in the detector here and you get a diffraction pattern looking something like this and then using uh, a Fourier transform a mathematical tool to go between uh, reciprocal space of the diffraction pattern to real space. Uh, you solve the structure, you produce an electron density map which you then uh, fit to the atomic structure as shown here. This is uh, inside the ribosome elements of the 16S and 23S RNAs and the, the blue outline is the electron density and the white shows the, uh, the fitting of the atomic model to, um, to the ribosome. And this is a cross section of the ribosome showing the two ribosomal subunits in, in blue and gray. Uh, on the left you see the messenger RNA wrapping around the neck of the small subunit. In, in orange is the tRNA reading the uh, codon on the left and uh, with a nascent polypeptide chain models an alpha helix coming down here uh, through a tunnel in the 50S or large subunit. And so right here is where the catalytic activity, the ribosome, uh, is stationed. And it's purely RNA there. So we know that the ribosome is a catalytic RNA at heart. Uh, it is a, a, what, what we call a ribosome. The, the elements are around the reading of the genetic code here in the decoding site are likewise almost exclusively RNA. And, and as we'll see, the, uh, the third main function is uh, decoding, peptide bond formation, and then translocation are all based on RNA. So th here's a, an animation to give you a sense of the, of, of the structure. The large subunit here, the in magenta are the proteins. The small subunit here, the dark blue are its proteins. The rest is the RNA. And here are the three tRNAs, the A site, P site, and, and uh, E site, and, and, and the uh, messenger RNA shown here. So, after formation of each peptide bond, you then need to move the tRNAs through the ribosome. These, as you saw, these are, these are large macromolecules themselves and uh, 25,000 Daltons each that need to be moved through the ribosome at the rate of about 20 per second uh, with great accuracy. And simultaneously, the messenger RNA needs to be moved along with the uh, tRNAs to maintain the trans relational reading frame. Um, so the ribosome is a vastly complex molecular machine, as you can see, and it has moving parts. By trapping the ribosome in intermediate states of its translocation cycle, we can re recreate its motions from frames consisting of individual crystal structures. And we can see that the movements of the ribosome in these different uh, states is coupled to the movement of the messenger RNA and the tRNAs through the ribosome. So here's a, uh, a movie of, of this going on. So first in the hybrid state, and then what we call the chimeric hybrid state, and back to the classical state. That's one round of, of translocation. And here's the first step, second step and then reset. And so this happens over and over again until you get to the end of the messenger RNA. Now you can see the tRNAs and message moving through in these three steps. And there are probably more steps than these, but these are the ones that we have 
high resolution crystal structures for so far. So one discovery from this is that rotation of the head domain of the small ribosomal subunit is crucial for movement of the mRNA and tRNA, the second step of translocation and, and the rate limiting step of translocation. Uh, and the um, rotation of the head is shown here. These are huge movements of about uh, over 30 angstroms uh, and so how does the ribosome create rotational movement of this head domain, which is one of the most fundamental molecular movements in, in life? So it turns out that rotation of the head domain originates at two molecular hinges connecting the head to the body in the small subunit, and that's shown here. One hinge is down here, hinge one. So in the non-rotated state, uh, helix 28, which makes up hinge one, is kinked. In the rotated state, shown in magenta, it straightens out. Um, hinge two is uh, at a three-way helical junction here. And you can see, going from the non-rotated to the rotated state, it moves upward like that. And these two hinging movements combine to create an overall rotational movement. And we can see that here. So that uh, hinge one uh, is down here, hinge two is up here. This is the uh, axis of rotation that we calculated mathematically. So this is the straightening then of hinge one, and this is the flexing of hinge two. And now we can take a, the, a top view now and look right down the rotational uh, Euler-Rodriguez axis shown here. This is the axis. And you can see the, the straightening of, of hinge one and the bending of hinge two. And these are, of course, uh, just the axes of the helices that we're talking about. And you can see in the, in the very fine uh, rendering the actual atomic positions. So molecular movement, as well as carrying out uh, tr the transfer of information, and we know that RNA is catalytic, we know that um, now that it can also move and, and create dynamic properties that are important for many biological functions. So we're asked to talk about what next, a 10-year plan. And uh, uh, so one question is, can we figure out how the ribosome evolved from an RNA world? And this, of course, is an experiment we can't do directly, but uh, the what we're trying to do now is to get a plausible series of events starting, say, with the periodic table and arriving at life. No problem. Uh, and then another big question, and this is one that, that we're addressing as a whole in the RNA Center at UC Santa Cruz, is can we learn what the RNA is for that is encoded by 99% of the human genome. Only 1% of the human genome codes for protein. All of it is transcribed, essentially, and we only know a, what a tiny fraction of that 99% is doing. But what we know is that there are critical small RNAs and large non-coding RNAs that are involved in regulatory functions uh, of the human genome. So. Is the ribosome a fossil of the RNA world? Uh, it's, it's made of protein and RNA, but most, if not all, of its functions are determined by its RNA, not its protein. So as, as Francis Crick proposed in 1968, the, uh, the first ribosome may have been made purely of RNA. Uh, but why did the ribosome evolve? It's, unimaginable that, I mean, there were no engineers sitting around saying, gee, it would be nice if we 
made uh, a, a string of amino acids, say two or 300 long, and it'll fold up in three dimensions and have specific binding sites and catalytic action. Uh, we, we, we're confident that that was not what was going on. But it, what may have been going on was that the synthesis of small pieces of protein, that is peptides, which could bind to RNA, would then confer on the RNA uh, an, an, an increased structure space, that the structural folding possibilities of RNA would have been greatly increased by these peptides which could also bring new chemical groups to the, to the RNA uh, and therefore new chemistry and new functions. Uh, and eventually these peptides could then uh, elaborate, become more complex, and float away on their own and eventually uh, become what we now call proteins. So another possibility uh, is that the uh, decoding function of the RNA evolved uh, from, the, from the RNA world. So what was going on in the RNA world that required something like the decoding function? Well, replication of RNA in the RNA world would have been critical, obviously, for the, uh, for the RNA to duplicate itself and carry on its, its own RNA genetic information. And we know that polymerization, adding one nucleotide at a time, is very inefficient in RNA-catalyzed chemistries. But what is, is very efficient is ligation. So in the decoding side of the ribosome, what we have is a little machine that enforces Watson-Crick base pairing between the codon and the anticodon. And it's highly accurate. Um, so in the RNA world, you could imagine a similar device could have been used for the, uh, enforcing the correct base pairing in replication of RNA. So here is a wild idea. Uh, it's untested so far, but we, we, we are, are, are thinking of how to test this. Uh, so this is the decoding side of the ribosome is essentially bringing in tRNAs and enforcing uh, triplet-triplet base pairing, um, often with um, a wild card in the third position where I have this N. So you have uh, G, C, A, U, C, G, C, G uh, in the first two positions. So this device then could be used in RNA replication in, in the following way, and, and what, what we've proposed is that there are duplicator RNAs. We want to distinguish duplication from replication here, and you'll see why. Uh, and these are little RNAs, and they may have been precursors of tRNA uh, with something like an anticodon down here, a degenerate triplet, so uh, with a, a, a wild card again in the third position. And then they have a little tail which is self-complementary. So for example, CGCG will pair with itself uh, so that you can form a homodimer of the duplicator RNAs. Uh, and then what you can do is take a, an RNA template and pair the uh, du duplicator RNA dimer to this and then it will, it will create a little three nucleotide template at the other end. So now you bring in from a pool of random trimers, which is uh, a possible uh, situation in the RNA world, you bring them in and enforce pairing here, and then you ligate the, uh, the new incoming triplet to the growing RNA chain. And, RNA ligases, several RNA ligases, of quite efficient ones, have been evolved uh, in the test tube made out of RNA. So we know this is not uh, a crazy idea, or not totally crazy, par partially crazy maybe. So, and what's interesting is that there are exactly 16 possible self-complementary tetramers. And so from this, you could imagine this could have been a, a starting set of, of 
uh, of tRNAs uh, are on the way to tRNAs, that uh, a rudimentary genetic code set uh, of 16 that would be expanded to 64 after you filled in the uh, third one. So the final question is the dark matter of biology as we think of it. The human genome contains 3 billion base pairs, only 1% uh, codes for protein, the other 99% codes for RNA. Uh, and we know the biological roles of only a tiny fraction of the 99%. Uh, and we know that some of them are, are really important uh, regulatory molecules. So what lies in there, we have no idea. But this would be a, a wonderful uh, project for the next decade for, for uh, many people in the RNA field. So I just want to close by thanking my co-workers, Jay Drill, uh, Laura Lancaster, John Paul Donahue, and uh, Srividya Mohan, and this is where we work. Thank you. <laughs>